continue the CI. So, we uh, talked of an important theorem of linear variation incidentally this particular theorem is of course, nothing to do with the CI it is related to linear variation. So, it is basically a mathematics theorem of mathematics ok. So, if you vary the web function which is expanded linearly in a basis which means the basis functions are known these are the only ones which are unknown ok. So, that is what we mean by linear expansion of course, if you change the basis function then it is no longer linear dependence because your basis usually contains exponential minus something times r. So, you have to change the exponent just like in hydrogen atom or r square whatever. So, usually they are not linear parameters changing. So, obviously in that case it will no longer be called linear variation. Linear variation means the parameters which you are varying they appear linearly in the expansion of the function. So, c's are linear if there is a c square or one term which is c square it is no longer linear I hope it is clear. So, I have a basis and if I had have added one more term let us say k square times some other chi another known function this would no longer be linear variation because k is an unknown parameter I have to vary k which is comes as a quadratic term ok. So, what we are talking about is only for linear variation the theorem says that if I do a variation by normal way that is vary this ok with respect to the coefficient c i then the result that you get is an eigenvalue equation which is h c equal to c e in a general form where c is the coefficient matrix ok which contains all the columns of the eigenvectors and e is the diagonal matrix consisting of all the eigenvalues of this uh, problem ok. The same and this is something that we have already proved long back I can again redo it that if I do taking this as a Lagrange multiplier that this let it be 1 ok and then you vary uh, these coefficients we have already proved it we can directly prove it again. So, this is what you get if you do the method of projection the theorem says that is instead of varying if you simply do a projection which I did last time. So, essentially start with this with this Schrodinger equation h psi equal to e psi and then put h expansion of h psi c i phi i equal to e times c i phi i. Then you project with one of the basis functions one at a time specific phi j then you will get phi j h phi i c i sum over i equal to e times c j if phi j and phi i is are orthonormal basis ok. If they are not orthonormal here also results will change. So, that is unimportant. So, we are assuming that the basis is orthonormal both in both cases. Note that if basis is non orthonormal results will still be identical except that it is no longer the eigenvalue equation and you should be able to guess what it will be the overlap matrix will come here just like we had in the Ruthan equation f c equal to s c similar things will come and you can then work on a non orthogonalized basis ok. So, then you can see that this equation gives you sum over i h j i c i equal to e c j which is again the same eigenvalue equation. So, this is the theorem we have already proved that what you will get here is in the last class we also proved this that by method of projection we again did it method of projection is actually very quick just one line proof that what I want to tell you that we can get the same equations all right. I hope all of you remember how we got this equation for the method of variation, but those who do not I will just refresh the mind that you expand this quantity subject to psi psi equal to 1 ok. So, what psi psi equal to 1 means in an orthonormal basis is it this means that 
sum over i ci star ci equal to 1, right. So, this expansion is very easy in orthonormal basis because you expand with a phi i dummy index, phi j dummy index, but phi i phi j is delta i j. So, you will get this. But then of course, psi h psi will be sum over i j c i star c j and uh, the matrix element between i and j of the Hamiltonian between i and j. So, you have h i j or h j i does not matter how you do it. So, this is what it is. So, you have to now put a Lagrangian which is sum over i j c i star c j h i j. Note that whenever I write h i j, it means phi i h phi j. So, that is that is normally the symbol. So, when I wrote here phi j h phi j, I wrote h j i, but it does not matter, okay. You can always change the dummy index, I mean to suit it to this form, okay, it is simple immaterial. But this minus some lambda times c i star c i minus 1. So, remember whenever you write Lagrange multiplier, make the equation as something equal to 0 and then only write the left hand side, okay. That is the trick. So, this is what you will vary with respect to c i and lambda. Of course, if you vary with respect to lambda, you will get this back this condition that is trivial and then you vary with c i. So, you get one particular c k, let us say you get h k j c j sum over j equal to lambda times c k. So, lambda becomes your e in that case. So, lambda time becomes your e. So, you can easily do this exercise. So, do with respect to let us say c i star. So, you will get so, del L del C i star will give you sum over j, C i star will be taken out, H i j C j, okay, equal to lambda times 1 C i will remain, only 1 C i will remain, specific C i, okay. So, that is the reason you normally do not like to write this C i, we will like to write this as some k. So, this will become H k j C j lambda C k. So, it is one and the same thing, okay, as long as you understand. This is no longer a dummy index here. So, you get the same equation as here. Please remember this is just i j interchanged, okay, otherwise it is the same equation. So, I think we had already done this. I just showed that the method of projection provides the same results and this is true in general. As a I, why, why did I say in mathematics? Because essentially Schrodinger equation is nothing but eigenvalue equation. So, for any eigenvalue equation, whenever you want to optimize the eigenvalue okay, by a variation principle, you will get the same result in the case of linear variation by either variation or method of projection. So, that is why in mathematics, it is it, actually a mathematical theorem, it is nothing to do with quantum chemistry per se. We are simply going to use this in quantum chemistry, is it clear? So, anywhere there is an eigenvalue equation, you can use variation principle to get the eigenvalue. So, it, it can be used in physics, engineering, several problems. And, and the theorems are all true. So, I think you should understand the generality. So, certain parts of quantum chemistry are very general. We, we, we are actually using mathematics to understand certain principles and they can be used anywhere, okay. So, with that, what we will do now to derive the CI equations, where of course, please remember our phi i's are now the basis. What are the basis in the configuration interaction? The basis is the basis of Slater determinant. So, there are n electron determinants, this is an n electron function. What we did was a general problem where psi and phi can be anything. It can be 1 electron, 2 electron, does not matter. But for our problem, this wave function is an n electron wave function. These are n electron Slater determinants, okay. So, we have to write the equations and quite clearly if there is n electron to, you will get the same equations. But to go through the pr principles of variation would have been more difficult. Of course, now we can directly go to the equation, okay. But I will still like to uh, write the method of projection just to show you the nature of this HIJ matrix because the key thing now is actually to get this matrix. That is a key thing, right. What is this matrix? This matrix is the matrix of Hamiltonian between the Slater determinants. Now, these are the Slater determinants right. So, all I need to calculate 
is the matrix of the Hamiltonian between Slater determinants and diagonal lines. So, the CI problem is extremely easy conceptually once you understand the mathematics that, that we do not have to go through the formula again, but I will go through uh, the, the uh, proof again, the derivation again, but the point is that you have to construct this matrix and diagonal lines. So, all the energies and then you have all the other theorems of the linear variation that each eigenvalue is an alpha bound to its own excited states, to its corresponding states, right. The Epstein, the, the, the McDonald theorem. So, remember the McDonald theorem, all that will apply now. So, in that case CI is a very powerful method because remember when you did hartree fock we are only talking of ground state. We are only talking of improving ground state for perturbation, but in CI we will get bow, upper bound for all states. So, CI becomes a potentially good method for deriving excited states, not just ground states. So, this is the first time we are talking of a method which is potentially can give you excited states. However, CI has lot of deficiencies, particularly approximate CI, which is what we will discuss, not the full CI. And that is where the CI, CI has really not been a very good method as it turned out to be. So, we will discuss that later. So, let me go through the the derivation once more, but this time I will do only by method of projection to show how this, this structure of the matrix and then of course to evaluate this matrix element. We already know how to evaluate the matrix element, right, by Slater rule. Depending on the two determinants, either they are equal, they are one occupancy difference, two occupancy difference, we should be able to write this Slater rule. But remember here, the determinants can be anything, any j, any i, so you have to be very careful in writing. So, that is a technical part when we actually write this letter rules, but we have all the what I want to convince you the entire tools that are required and its consequences have already been covered. So, in a way CI is very easy. What we have to really do are the deficiencies of the CI. So, what we will now do is to go back to our CI problem and uh, remind you that your psi was uh, C0. Uh, you can use phi or psi, does not matter what you want to use. Then you have C A R, psi A R and so on. When you, when you presented the general problem, our wave function was a very, very easy, we can write by one index. Now, what we are doing is that these are my phi i's, but they contain other indices a, r, a, b, r, s that is only to determine the determinant, the basis itself with reference to Hartree form. So, that is why all these, all these uh, indices are coming, but please remember all these indices together is what was my i here, okay. So, so a, a combination of a, b, r, s was actually one of the i there. So, that is, uh, so I just want to tell you that nothing has changed. It is just that these are now uh, necessary to track your basis itself, okay. So, let us uh, cut this here. If I approximate and this is something I want to tell you now, if I approximate my wave function just here, then of course, it is no longer full CI, okay. So, it is no longer exact even in a finite basis, okay. So, it is not even exact in the finite basis, I should say other way around. It is not even exact in the finite basis. It is an approximate. So, there are two kinds of approximate. One is basis approximation that I talked of. Another is the fact that I am truncating CI because even in a finite basis, MCN is too large a number, okay. So, to really do a matrix sol equation solution because then this Hamiltonian matrix will become MCN by MCN and you can very quickly find out what is MCN. Let us say M is 100, which is, a, which is a good basis or even 50 and N is only 10. So, you are talking of a very modest electron like a like molecule like methane and you have 50 basis, which is about the basis that you will today, the referees will always demand for any calculation and it is a 50 C 10 and please do that number, you will see it is a huge number. We are talking of 50 C 10. So, you have 50 factorial by 10 factorial, 40 factorial. 40 factorial fortunately helps you. I had to cut lot of things, but you still have 41 into 50, 41 into and divide by 10 factorial. Please do that number and how quickly the number blows up, okay. So, so you can see 
I mean people do not realize what is this MCM, it is a factorial expansion and, and eventually it is simply not doable, you know, up beyond a point. So, obviously we have to approximate and this is where now the physics comes in, how do I approximate? So, obviously the first thing that you will take is the doubly excited determinant. Because now I am not going to, I am going to approximate based on a physics and I have now realized from MP2 calculation as well as the synodal glue articles that we described physically that the most important correlation comes from the pair correlation. So, the two electrons try to avoid each other. So, they get excited, they get excited out of hartree fock to form another determinant from another basis. Remember that excited is again not excited state we are still talking of everything for ground state. So, this is still a function of the ground state should right size 0. Eventually of course, we will get all the excited states for a, for a very different perspective in CI, but it whether ground or excited does not matter. What I want to show that these determinants are also contributing to ground state, okay. They will also contribute to other states eventually because you have an eigenvalue problem. So, obviously the f if we have to take only one class of determinants ap apart from hartree fock I will choose this, that is the first thing because I have learned that. Then, then you have a choice, what will be your second class? Will you take singles? Will you take triples? Singles you will not eliminate because I told you Brillouin's theorem only shows that the Hamiltonian matrix element between hartree fock and singly excited is 0 and you will see that why singles will contribute if you have doubles. Before I do this, let me first convince you that only singles is no good. Okay, because of Brillouin's theorem. So, let us take an even simpler approximation which I now call it CIS where I write psi 0 as C0 psi hartree fock plus sum over AR CAR psi AR. So, that is all I just cut it. I call it CIS it means configuration interaction including only singly excited determinants. Okay, so, S is S is an acronym which just says singles. So, I can now derive this the method of projection once again, but actually it is trivial I can directly come to the, the solution, but the point is what you will do is first write this as C0 psi hartree fock plus sum over AR C AR psi hartree fock psi AR. Note that I am just rederiving. Okay, so this is nothing new. E C0 psi hartree fock plus sum over ARC. Okay. So I continue with the CIS. So what you do is to project with these basics, right? So first projection would be with psi hartree fock. So psi hartree fock itself is a member of the basis. So, I project to the psi hartree fock. So, C i s continued. So, you have psi hartree fock. Let us see what you get. H. So, I am projecting on the right hand side. H psi hartree fock times C 0, right, plus psi hartree fock H psi a r times C a r sum over all a r. So, that is my first equation equal to psi hartree fock is orthogonal to psi AR. So, I will only get E times C naught. Just as I should get, just as I should get, okay, E times C 0 because J is now my phi hartree fock. So, I just wanted to make, make sure that you get the same thing. These are my H i J matrices, all right. And then the second one would be project with a psi AR, but since I am using AR as dummy index, let me let me use the J as B S. So, another set of another set of virtual occupi occupied and virtual orbitals B 2 S excited. So, this is one specific determinant out of these basis, okay. The A and R are dummy in this case. So, any particular B S. So, you will get again H psi hartree fock C 0 plus sum over AR psi B S H psi AR C AR right equal to E times C B S okay. So, 
So that is the reason I wanted to redo it again because it's just that symbols are little bit different. You should get E C J. So yes, J is nothing but psi, psi J is nothing but psi B S. So you'll get E times C B S. That coefficient, coefficient for psi B S, which is C J there, and that is also easy to see because if you if you project with psi Hartree Fock again, psi B S will become zero. Here all A R will get zero except when A equal to B R equal to S. So exactly that particular determinant. That is the only one which survive. And then the coefficient will become CBS. Is it clear? It's exactly restating this problem, but just in a different language. Okay. This is my equations for which I have to get solutions. And you can see my first term is E Hartree Fock. E Hartree Fock C0. And then the second term is 0 because of Brunner's theorem. So I have E Hartree Fock C0 as E C0. Correct, this is my exact energy, okay, whatever E naught or whatever, E naught you can say, this is my exact energy. Now note that without doing anything for the second equation, I already have a trivial result, my exact ground state is nothing but Hartree Fock. Divide by C0 on the left and right hand side. So my ground state energy at least does not improve, okay. I can show how by matrix part because this is where the matrix part will come, the rest of the part will come. But clearly from the first equation because of Brillouin's theorem, I have E Hartree Fock equal to E naught. So at least for the ground state, there is no improvement. And that is the reason CIS is never practiced for ground state. But what about the other states because I, it is an eigenvalue problem. So I can get the other excited states. So that will of course come bec of the, because of the second equation. So I will get this, so I will, I can write this now, show this by matrix structure. So my matrix of Hamiltonian will look like the following thing, so CIS. So the first part will be E Hartree Fock, right? So that is your first part. Then the rest of the HGI will be with Psi Hartree Fock and Psi AR. So these are all 0. So this entire row of Hartree Fock to singly excited will be 0. Similarly, when I come here, this part is 0. It is a, it is just a complex conjugate of this term. So this is also 0. So this in a way can be written as all columns are 0. Note that this is a row, column of psi Hartree Fock. This is the column of all singly excited determinant. This is the row of psi Hartree Fock. And these are, so this is Hartree Fock and these are all psi A R. So I have just rearranging the matrix element. So right. So this is basically matrix element between psi Hartree Fock and psi A R. This is matrix ele elements between a particular psi B S with psi Hartree Fock and so on. And this is the main part which is now new in C I S, which is basically represented here. This is a matrix element of the Hamiltonian between one singly excited to another singly excited and they will of course survive. So let me call this block HSS. It just means between two singly excited determinants. So this is a block. This is no longer one term because there is a set of singly excited determinants. There is a set of singly excited determinants. I am of course projecting with one particular BS here, but I have to do one by one to get the eigenvalue structure. And then I have C0 which is the coefficient that I am looking at and then I have all the CARs, so entire CAR, right, whose number is exactly same as this number, m by m number. So all the singles I will get equal to E times a particular coefficient, okay. If I write it in this manner, of course, this would mean that depending on what is my row here, I will get that particular coefficient. So it in a way, in a simpler way. The way it is written is that you actually write this as a unitary matrix for all groups and then you can write this way. But if I write for one column also does not matter. So basically you have E, C0 and all C A R, all C A R, okay. So depending on which row you pick up for matrix multiplication, you will get only that number. I hope all of you are familiar with matrices, I am telling you again, so all matrices you have to be very familiar. 
So, we have already re re discovered that if I multiply first row times first column and that is what we have done here, first row times first column you get only E times C naught and E is nothing but E hat root or E naught is nothing but E hat root, okay. So, that is the first equation which is trivial. So, ground state does not improve. However, if I take the other rows, let us say second row, third row, etc., times a column, then you start to get an equation, okay, which will now give you other roots because you get a full equation. So, basically, I have to diagonalize this matrix. Essentially, I am diagonalizing this matrix, and you can see this matrix has a very nice structure that the first row and the first column are decoupled from the rest, right. So, the first row in first column has a number E hat to four. But the rest is 0 here, rest is 0 here. Such a matrix is called block diagonal matrix. I think we have introduced it before, but I want to again restate it. It is not a diagonal matrix, but it is a block diagonal matrix. So, this is a matrix of two blocks, one is Hartree Fock, another is singles. Between these two blocks, it is diagonal. Within this block, of course, it is not diagonal. So, this eigenvalue problem can be easily done by diagonalizing the two separate blocks. So, if I have a block diagonal structure of a matrix, so for example, uh, give, you an, give you an example of let us say a 4 by 4 matrix. So, I have a block of 2 by 2 and 0, 0, another block of 2 by 2. So, these are, these are the blocks which exist, block 1, block 2 and I have to diagonalize the entire block, then instead of diagonalizing 4 by 4 matrix, you diagonalize x1 2 by 2 and x2 2 by 2. This is much simpler because you are diagonalizing 2 by 2 matrices instead of 4 by 4 matrix. I hope all of you know this that diagonalizing a 2 by 2 matrix, 2 2 by 2 matrices is much cheaper than diagonalizing 1 4 by 4 matrix. And that is very important for you to know that diagonalization is the CPU or whatever is proportional to NQ, not linear. If it is linear, then you would say, what, what do I gain? I am doing 2 times 2 by 2 instead of 1 4 by 4. But unfortunately, it is extremely nonlinear. So, if it is 4 by 4, it has a prefactor and it goes as 4 cube. If it is 2 by 2, it goes as 2 cube. So, then 2 times 2 cube is much less, that is 16, 4 cube is 64, right. So, this is a very important part in all the computation and I think one thing you have to remember that the CPU computer time for a step of diagonalization goes as n cube, just remember this. So, if you diagonalize a 2 by 2 matrix and a 4 by 4 matrix, you will require 8 times more computer time because it is 2 times more, so the computer time will become 2 cube, is it clear? And that is the reason this is much cheaper than diagonalizing the full. So, the recognition of a block diagonal structure of a matrix is a very, very important part. In fact, this is something that you will later learn in the group theory course, symmetry course, that we use symmetry of the basis phi i, phi j or whatever, such that in a CI problem, I can block diagonalize. Because the Hamiltonian matrix, Hamiltonian matrix element between the two bases of different symmetry is 0, just like here it is 0 because of Brillouin's theorem. So, if I have a phi i of one symmetry, phi j of another symmetry, we will not worry about what is that, there are representation, irreducible representation, etc. Then the matrix, uh, matrix element is 0. Once the matrix element is 0, you can quite easily get a block diagonal structure and that is the reason group theory is very, very important, it simplifies life. But I think this is an example of that that because of the entire block of psi a r does not couple with psi Hartree Fock, I get a block diagonal structure. So, I can get ground state energy directly as the Hartree Fock and then I just diagonalize HSS. HSS is not 0 of course, you know there is a structure of HSS, we will discuss that. So, if you diagonalize this, you will get rest of the eigenvalues and they will be your excited states. Remember, you will get excited states. So, CIS he cannot, is not used for ground state. I hope now everybody can defend why, because the ground state does not improve. Hartree Fock remains Hartree Fock, but it can be used to get excited state. A 
okay, because the eigenvalues of HSS block will give you excited states. Of course, you will argue that the states are not good, that is a different matter because I have not used doubles or triples, I have, I have made a very serious truncation that, that only singles. So, results will not be good, but at least you will get a results. In fact, many times in the programs, Gaussian or games, when people use a very large molecule to get a rough estimate of the excited states, this is what is done CIS. But CIS is never done for ground state and I think that is the uh, physics that you should remember that the ground state will not improve because of this of this coupling terms being 0, okay. And that is because of Brillouin's theorem. If I would have used non Hartree-Fock orbitals, then of course, it would be a completely different matter because there no Brillouin's theorem is there. So, as long as I am building my determinants out of a Hartree-Fock orbitals and virtual orbitals which are ortho orthogonal to the Hartree-Fock orbitals, I will have Brillouin's theorem and then ground state will never improve by CIS. So, to get an estimate, a first estimate of the ground state, however bad it is, you must have doubles. That is, that is very important to realize. Only singles will not help. The question is, do you want only doubles or you want singles and doubles? Of course, singles and doubles will be better than only doubles because more the merrier. So, you can get by direct solution of the Fock operator or Ruthan equation or you can have some other ortho orthogonal pieces which you know are orthogonal. Then I do not care how. Yeah, so Hartree-Fock orbitals are separate. After that, you can have a separate set of virtual orbitals. They need not come from the equation. In fact, that is an interesting part. How will you get it is a different matter, okay. But if God gives you, no problem. You can live with that, <laughs> okay. But of course, this is the better way to get it anyway. Uh, once you have a Ruthan equation. So, uh, okay. So, the point is the, the CIS is also very useful to obtain excited states. And these excited states also have a variational principle that they are upper bounds, just as we said for the McDonald theorem, okay. So, McDonald theorem anyway holds good for all variation. I do not care how many bases you use, okay. So, they are, they are very nice, uh, uh, but then we are interested in the ground state. So, we have to look at a somewhat better method. So, the first method, but, but before I do that, let me, let me just analyze the HSS block. The block of the Hamiltonian matrix element between the singly excited and doubly excited, I think two singly excited. So, essentially this block has psi B s h psi a r, right. For some a r, some B s, okay, which can be arbitrary now. Now, clearly you can see that at all, all times you can use flatter rules. Note that when a r is equal to B s, you should use which letter rules? The first one, because that is an average value, though it is no longer with Hartree Fock, but I hope you will be able to do that. So, for example, if I have a two electron problem, my Hartree Fock is let us say 1, 2, and one of the excited determinants is 1, 3, another can be 1, 4, 2, 3, 2, 4, these are all excited determinants, right, and so on depending on how many virtuals are there. Let us say I have only two virtual spin orbitals, 3 and 4. I am talking everything in terms of spin orbitals incidentally. Then what I am saying is that if I have one singly excited determinant, this is my Hartree Fock. If I have one singly excited determinant here, another singly excited determinant there which is identical, then I am going to use simply my previous rule 1. But then rule 1, we have always use for 1, 2. But now do not get confused. Rule 1 is general. It just says whatever are the occupied orbitals in the determinants, right. So, this would have become H11 plus H33, for example, the first term. And then, then you will have rest of the anti symmetrized matrix element. You can actually write them down that by I, I less than J, IJ, 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 okay, anti symmetric. So, you can write them down very easily. And of course, then later on when you do spin integration, depending on whether this is a uh, up spin, down spin, you can say if there is a Coulomb or exchange. I hope you remember that. That comes much later when I do spin integration. That I will say that for parallel spins, I have Coulomb as well as exchange. For anti parallel spins, I have only Coulomb. I hope you remember, huh? we have done this. Please revise all this for the end same, the entire thing will come. Huh? It almost looks like ages when we did this, I think. <laughs> Though I have done it even in 4 to 5 actually, those who have attended. So, that comes in spin integration. So, Coulomb and exchange of orbit, uh, 
integral that we talk of is actually in terms of spatial orbitals in spin integrals. Okay. Right now, I have a general form which is half i j i j anti symmetrical, right, which can be written as i less than j i j i j. So, in this case, it is very easy because there is only one term. So, I can very quickly write this as 1 3 anti symmetrized boundary, nothing else is there and no half. Half will take care of the fact that there was a 3 1 3 1 which I did not write, okay. So, and 1 1 1 1 3 3 3 3 0. So, this is just that, okay, just to show you this letter rule. However, there would be terms which is A, R and B, S are different. Now, there are lots of diff possibilities. For example, I have a coupling between 1, 3 and 2, 3. For this, I am going to use rule B, right, because they have only one occupation difference and the result will be simply 1, H, 2 and then there is a another term for the 2 electron integral, correct. On the other hand, I can have 1, 3 and 2, 4. Then I have to use rule C because both are different. It is a doubly excited and there will be one only 2 electron integral which will survive between 1, 3 and 2, 4, okay. So, please even to construct HSS, you have to be careful about which rules to apply and how to apply, okay. Do not start writing the formula for Hartree Fox because that is something that comes out of my memory all the time. Uh, please understand, uh, try to understand the formula. What are, what are orbitals is what you have to understand and then you have to write. So, for example, if I have to write 1, 3, H, 2, R determinant, which is actually a part of the single x-ray determinant. So, I hope you understand what I mean by 1, 3. These are all determinants actually, just to make sure uh, that you understand, okay. These are all determinants. So, what will be the result? There will be no 2 electron integral, uh, 1 electron integral. There will be only 2 electron integral and this will be 1, 3, 2, R, 2, 4, sorry. Correct. And of course, then you will write it in regular integrals. This 1, 3, 2, 4 minus 1, 3, 4, 2. Then if I give you what is spins, you have to do spin integration. So, all that will come up after that. So, please understand the steps. Because right now, I am writing as a generically as a in terms of spin orbitals. And then of course, I will specify the spin orbitals in terms of space orbitals with alpha and beta and that will help you to spin integrate. You cannot spin integrate unless you know that, okay. So, this is how it goes. So, you have to apply depending on rule B, C, rule, uh, the, depending on the determinants either rule A, rule B, rule C. So, HSS will of course, not be diagonal or even block diagonal. There may be some lots of elements which will be 0, but very hard to identify. Lots of elements will still be 0. Okay, even here, but that is because of symmetry. Otherwise, if you see the maximum difference between a psi AR and psi BS is how much? For any n electron problem, 2. It cannot be more than 2. Even for any 10 electron, 20 electron, does not matter because rest of the orbitals are same, spin orbitals are same. The only difference in here already A is replaced by R. So, R is there. Here B is replaced by S. So, if A is not equal to B, R is not equal to S. Occupancy difference is still only 2, okay. So, I think this is what would be interesting is if A is equal to B, R is not equal to A. So, that is a case where 1, 3, 1, 4, where A is equal to B, uh, that is 2, which is replaced by 3 and 4. So, you can see the difference is only 1. In the case A is not equal to B, R is not equal to S, the difference is 2, but it will never be more than 2. So, by Slater rule, every term will survive actually. This is a very interesting part for the single singles block. Every term will survive, but it practically becomes sparse because of spatial symmetry. That is a completely point that we are not discussing. That is part of the group theory. That is certain integrals like 1, 3, 2, 3 like this or yeah, 1, 3, 2, 4, let us say. It normally should survive by Slater rules, but it must still become 0 because of the symmetry of 1, 2, 3, 4. That when I actually calculate the integral, it becomes 0. That is, that cannot be predicted by Slater rule, okay. That comes of a different symmetry. So, please understand that two, there are different levels. Slater rule directly says certain things will be 0, okay. Triples, 3 occupancy, 4 occupancy, they are all 0. 
single occupancy based on Hartree Fock is 0 because of Brillo theorem, only from Hartree Fock to singles, but not from 1 singles to 1 single. Okay, so do not use Brillo's theorem for this, huh? because I know a lot of people will use it. Just, <laughs> just as 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 3 is 0, 1, 3, 2, 3 is not 0. I hope you understand what I mean, huh? because this is no longer Hartree Fock. Brillo's theorem is only when there is a Hartree Fock determinant and H and SIF. That is zero. So when you apply Brillouin's theorem, be careful. Okay. So, so the so in in principle they may survive, but because of spatial symmetry, when you actually calculate the integral, the integral may turn out to be zero. So there is a lot of sparsity that will come in the matrix. I hope all of you know what is sparse. Sparse matrix. What is sparse matrix? where most of the elements are 0, okay, or many elements are 0. So, the sparsity index is very important. How sparse is my matrix? It is, if the matrices are very sparse, then it is good for me, because most of the elements are 0. Uh, people should know how to do it, because normal algorithms will not work, because you do not want to process zeros. You want to only process elements which are non-zero, and this is a very important technique in CI. How to write an eigenvalue equation involve eigenvalue solution involving only non-zero elements. So if I write a matrix times matrix, you normally write a loop driven code that will not work. Okay. So the matrices are sparse, so that is a good thing, even for singles to singles block. And later on, of course, you will see much more sparse matrices will come when you go further because of Slater rule. All right. So the point that I am trying to say that for ground state, CIS is not important. And even for excited states, CIS gives results, but they will not give good results, obviously, but they give a reasonable result. 